Hello, everyone. Shall we settle down and get ready for the next session? Okay. Yes, yeah, so welcome back from lunch. So I want to welcome you to this session on gender. This will run for the next hour and a half. Um, so I'm very pleased to be the facilitator for this session. My name is Inkechi Obu. I'm based at the University of Ghana, Department of Economics, but currently on sabbatical and sitting at the Development Economics Research Group at the World Bank. So today, we have a great lineup of speakers. So we will start off with Eliana LaFerrera, and she's going to talk to us about what we have learned so far in the past 20 years as it relates with gender. Um, so after her, we'll have two more discussants, and um, so Eliana will have 30 minutes for her presentation, and then each of the other discussants, as we have seen, will have 15 minutes each. Now, we want to give the opportunity to the audience to be able to ask questions after. So please don't make me cut you off, so just make sure you stick to your allotted time. So Eliana, I invite you to come up to the podium, 30 minutes. Let's walk up. Come here. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks for inviting me, it's really an honor, and I want to thank the Foundation and STIAS for giving us the opportunity to learn from each other over the coming days. The morning has been really uh, inspiring for me. Uh, I'm gonna talk about gender uh, and development. Uh, uh, I found this to be a bit of a daunting task when I put my mind to it, so I decided uh, there's no way I can give justice to everything that relates to gender and development. You're gonna have a gender angle in every single session pretty much uh, these days. But uh, we'll try to follow the journey um, of a young woman, uh, I will call her Aisha, from the moment she is born until she ages. And we'll ask the question, how is her life gonna be different from the life she would have? if she were a boy. And uh, in particular, I will focus on the role that uh, societal norms play in shaping the constraints that Aisha will face. So the first thing to know is that Aisha is actually less likely to be born uh, than uh, if she were a boy. Uh, we know that uh, the male to female birth ratio is very skewed in many countries. The biological one is around 1 of 5.5. You see places like China and India have ratios that are way off uh, the chart with respect to the, that benchmark. And this is not a, a new phenomenon. Uh, Amartya Sen uh, spoke about uh, missing women uh, in the early 90s. Uh, it's often understood as being associated with costs of raising girls, for example, because of dowries or other um, uh, associated costs. And uh, the phenomenon has gotten worse since the advent of sex selective abortion. There are some studies that have shown how uh, basically this technology has uh, contributed to uh, more biased uh, sex ratios. We know that it's driven by high parity, so later born girls, and that uh, actually from the moment that this sex selective abortion has taken up, uh, there have been differences when it comes to rates of neglect uh, for the sisters that uh, are actually still born. Uh, um, and so this is a little bit of a, a contrasting uh, um, effect uh, that we're gonna discuss when we come to policy. And in recent times, because of the evidence that we have based on sex ratios, uh, confronting some limitations, uh, um, work by uh, uh, Balanca saint vautrin for example, has argued that we can have methods of assessing parental bias that uh, don't require using sex ratios and that basically look at different predic predictions coming from uh, instrumental births, that is trying to achieve a certain number of boys versus selective abortions. And so there's still work that people are doing on this very old question. Uh, one of the key uh, implications, if you think of policy, is that uh, banning selective abortions uh, uh, is not 
per se going to fix the problem because if the underlying preference for sons is still there, uh, families will find uh, other ways uh, to, to achieve the desired ratios and uh, we cannot prevent forms of neglect unless we change that underlying norms. And so how do we reduce some preference? Uh, you know, if think attempts have been made thinking about uh, inheritance or social security reform, but uh, I don't think we know enough about what type of status is also associated with having a son. And this is something that you observe at different levels of development. So uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, themes that you could think about uh, is uh, thinking about preferences that are not uniquely driven by material incentives and how much do we need to take those into account when we do economics. So Aisha is going to start growing up and uh, she's less likely to see her parents invest as much as they would do if, uh, than if she were a boy. And here there's a lot of work. Uh, we cannot, you know, start uh, discussing it, Isaac and the panel will do a much better job, but uh, um, pa parents might respond to differential returns to education for boys and girls, and when uh, returns change, they might adjust their choices. Parents hold different beliefs when it comes to skills of girls and boys, and it invest uh, following those beliefs. Uh, uh, they hold stereotypes of what girls are good at, uh, and there are concerns that are unique to being a girl, like safety, that uh, affect choices. Uh, a recent uh, very interesting paper shows uh, uh, um, young uh, college students in India selecting colleges that are not the best they could go to simply because the route to those college, colleges is safer. And finally, there are norms around purity, for example, that lead parents to, to pull the girls off school or you know, keep them home uh, and uh, reduce attendance. Uh, around puberty. In health, Pascaline highlighted a lot of, uh, uh, you know, gender biases uh, uh, when it comes to health status of women. So we, uh, part of these biases also come from the, the, the fact that the girls are on average in larger families, they are breastfed for shorter periods, have higher risk of neglect, and uh, there's shorter birth spacing following the birth of a girl. Uh, also, girls are more likely to be subject to harmful practices. Uh, later in the talk, I will talk about female genital cutting. Uh, and uh, this is actually a norm that's uh, extremely harmful. It's prevalent in over uh, 20, in 27 African countries, affects 200 million girls worldwide, uh, and uh, it has very severe health consequences. Uh, just for reference, the dark blue countries are countries where the prevalence is above 90%. And uh, existing explanations have to do with marriage markets or with the fact that people cannot coordinate out of bad equilibria or with identity. We'll try to see how much we can do uh, to, you know, uh, get out of this equilibrium. Next stop is going to be marriage, and uh, it's kind of not at all unlikely that Aisha will be married before age 18. Here you see uh, UNICEF data on the share of women age 20 to 24 who were married or in a union before age 18. There's been a decrease in the past 20 or so years, but we're still at a rate around 20%. And this phenomenon of early or child marriage is not really um, going to disappear anytime soon. It has very negative consequences, and uh, we've learned that uh, you know, there are, in the presence of marriage payments, shocks are actually uh, possibly triggering uh, uh, more child marriage. Uh, and that there are ways that policies can try to disincentivize it, for example, through conditional transfers. But um, the, you know, the, the way, the extent to which this can be scaled up, I think is a bit problematic if we think of uh, the budgets that uh, many governments face. So again, this is a case where um, the underlying preferences uh, would need to change. Uh, marriage payments are associated with most of these marriages, uh, diaries, bride prices, uh, 
economists have studied them. Do they clear markets? Do they uh, cope with market imperfections in, tra in the transmission of wealth? They have consequences. They affect uh, savings behavior of the parents. Uh, uh, and they can be used to facilitate migration. But why do we still see marriage payments in areas that have faced rapid growth? Um, you know, models that uh, predict uh, that increasing returns to women's human capital lead to, should lead to the disappearance of marriage payments are not apparently uh, what we see in the data. And so, here, the intersection with other cleavages, for example, caste in India, can shed light why these payments are still persistent. Then, uh, if we're thinking about a woman's life in the marriage, a lot of what's going on has to do with the decisions that are made within that marriage. And there, our friend will not clearly have as much say in those decisions as her husband. Uh, there's a very large literature on decision making in the household and intra-household allocation. I will not go into it because I think Nava and Dori uh, are going to focus on some of this. We know that the unitary model is typically rejected in the data. Cooperative models uh, you know, have restrictions that have not being rejected, but evidence, like the one that Chris mentioned this morning, uh, in terms of inefficiencies, clearly lead to uh, rejections of some of these uh, uh, predictions. And then there are pervasive information asymmetries. And there's non-cooperative models on which uh, we have much less of a structured framework compared to unitary and collective. So here, there's work that can be done. And as I said, I won't uh, go into it, but one thing to keep very well in mind is that even within the collective efficient framework, uh, uh, recent work that has tried to estimate sharing rules, that is how what share of the resources goes to different members of the household, has highlighted uh, very unequal uh, sharing, uh, where women have systematically lower share of resources that they consume in the household. And um, even no, this is not only true for the poor, even in non-poor households, you actually find women and children that will fall below the poverty line. So if you think about what we know in this domain, a lot of it comes from uh, structural estimates from these collective household models. Uh, I think uh, in the future it would be very important to have much better data that allows us uh, to document these inequalities within the household because, again, we need to put some numbers out there on how strong the inequalities are at this very micro level. The underlying question, I think, here is why is it that these allocations are so biased against women? Why are they at a disadvantage when it comes to bargaining? Uh, in bargaining, your outside options are all that matters, and clearly women have worse outside options. Some of the reasons are exogenous. The norms, the institutions, are not in their favor. Think about divorce. If divorce is either not possible or frowned upon, uh, you cannot exit the marriage. Uh, bride price that you need to return in case of divorce acts as a constraint. Unequal inheritance, polygyny, all of these kind of undermine the bargaining position of women. And uh, in this map, you see the colored uh, regions are those where laws uh, are not, do not guarantee equal divorce uh, uh, to women and men, either by statutory law or customary law. So that there's a lot of progress that we can make on the institutional front. But there are also outside options that are generated by household and women and their parents' choices. For example, irreversible investments in education, early fertility, uh, specialization, and here, Basically, uh, women might not be in a position where they can quit. Also, the co-residence patterns in patrilocal society often imply being near or living together with the husband's family, which doesn't put you at a, a very good bargaining position, as Esther's early work uh, on South Africa also showed. And then the limits to mechanisms that would facilitate cooperation. If you think about uh, 
our idea of a love marriage, part of what keeps you uh, in a good relationship is that you care about the other person and about sustaining that harmonious couple's life in the long uh, run. And uh, early marriage or arranged marriage may not rely, be able to rely so much on these uh, other the regarding preferences. And finally, intimate partner violence is really a strong friction to bargaining. Here, the, I always find these statistics staggering. Uh, you are seeing the share of women who agree that a husband is justified in beating his wife. And, uh, orange, yellow, and so on, is something that's above uh, 50%. So these are not men expressing a preference for violence, it's women believing that it is actually okay. And um, why and how, what can we do about uh, uh, these underlying preference? Uh, uh, you could think that working on outside option is gonna help, uh, and there is work that has looked at property rights. Uh, um, a very nice paper recently done in Rwanda on the provision of paid employment, and so an improvement in outside option in terms of economic independence, reducing uh, uh, violence. Uh, kind of give us hope, but at the same time, we have findings where psychological uh, violence increases with the education or um, theories of male backlash. So uh, the reason why violence is still widely accepted, I think is something that we uh, don't have a good answer with. There's um, a, an, an extent to which internalizing potentially men's preferences uh, is something that we haven't uh, understood. Uh, and I think also, other social sciences pay a lot more attention to the notion of power than what we do in our models. Um, we are currently working on better measurement of control over resources. Uh, SEMA has worked on this. There are, again, structural measures, lab in the field experiments. Uh, but if you think of the modeling side, our models uh, uh, of intra-household relations do not incorporate these notions. Once she is uh, old enough, uh, or maybe not so old, uh, Aisha is gonna start working, or maybe not. Uh, we know that even if she works, her job will be most likely low paying. Um, female labor force participation is extremely low. You see the bottom uh, line there is uh, for the Middle East and North Africa, and the one, the purple life is South Asia. These two regions have very low female labor force participation. Um, Africa, not so low. Uh, obstacles to female labor force participation range from you know, commitments to housework and childcare that's not shared by other members to concerns around safety, both at work and to um, reach the workplace, uh, but also disagreement in the household. Men can have veto power over whether the woman works or not. Uh, and we've seen recently that having people talk about this doesn't necessarily help. It could actually reduce female labor force participation. So the extent to which men uh, might actually disagree with their wives on the appropriateness of work can be seen in this cross-country data that's been collected by a number of researchers through the Gallup poll. And you see in the countries on the left, the support for work outside the home is much higher among women, the yellow dots, than among the men who are the blue dots. And these are countries where the female labor force participation is particularly low. Now, the role of norms here, I think, is very uh, clear. Uh, people might, there might be persistence of uh, outdated roles that people have inherited from their mothers or social sanctions in society, and also misperceptions, uh, as we will see later on. The last bit of life I want to discuss before digging into the norms angle is aging. And, uh, Aisha is very likely to uh, experience hardship when she's old. Uh, Anderson and Ray have uh, brought to our attention the fact that a large share of missing women is actually old. Uh, Ted's worked on the 
phenomenon of killing witches, which are often old women that you cannot support in times of shocks. Widowhood is associated uh, with poverty, and uh, uh, old women often cannot rely on assets uh, that they inherit when their husbands die, simply because inheritance laws are unequal. Now, if we think about life expectancy increasing, we're gonna be having more and more old women and uh, in the absence of social safety nets. And with societies that are slowly moving towards a nuclear family model, uh, what's gonna happen? We're gonna see a lot of poverty and more inequality in this age range. So some of what I've hinted at so far is that even though we can think of various types of policy solutions, uh, if you were able to align preferences with preferences that generate more equal allocations, a lot of the problems would be solved. And how do we think about these norms change, given that we know they're so persistent, that they have uh, you know, long cultural uh, roots, uh, one is that we might just simply ask what's gonna happen with the process, natural process of norms evolution, and the other is, should we give it a push? Now, if you think of the process of natural evolution, with a number of co-authors recently, we've been trying to ask a simple question. Think that we are in a world where you're starting from a norm that you don't like. You could think that this is a gender unequal norm like women are not allowed to work for pay. Or in the case that we're studying, uh, there's a female genital cutting. And so in this bad equilibrium, most people are choosing a given trait. And then you want to eliminate that trait in the long run, but you're asking what would happen if instead of trying to jump directly to the best possible world, there was some mildly unequal alternative in the middle. So you could say we allow women to work for pay, but they do it from home, okay? So re remote work. Or you could think of forms of FGC that are not as harmful when it comes to health consequences. Now, what this is doing to the transition is not Trivia, why? Because on the positive side, what you can think is that people who are reluctant to completely abandon the trait might be persuaded to go towards the smaller step of uh, the less harmful alternative. So people who don't want to just allow their wives to work might be okay having the wife work from home. And eventually, once she takes that step, there's another little step you can take until you converge all the way to the good equilibrium. And this is what we call stepping stone convergence. But at the same time, this could work against you, why? Because in the new place where you are, the incentives to go all the way are actually not so great. If my wife is now earning money because she works from home, what's my incentive to now allow her to go and work outside, okay? And so because these costs might get you stuck in an absorbing state, it's not clear from a policy perspective whether these intermediate uh, uh, solutions should or should not be incentivized. And so what we've done in this paper is basically trying to propose a model and understand what this model implies looking at the case of FGC in Somalia. And I showed you those maps, but Somalia is one of the few countries where the worst form of FGC that is in fibrillation is uh, uh, still practice, and in fact, there are different types of cutting, Sunna, which is uh, slightly less harmful, and what's called pharaonic circumcision. And when we collected data looking by cohort at the type of cut that women had, we found this striking pattern that every woman, first of all, basically 99% uh, of women um, undergo uh, female genital cutting, but the, the type of cut until the early 90s was almost universally pharaonic, so the most harmful, and then there was this transition where Sunna took over, okay? 
And then you could think this is actually possibly a good thing in the sense that eventually it's going to be easier to move away from this equilibrium. And when we look at the data and see what the model predicts, we're actually finding that the answer is no. And one of the reasons why it's no is that actually people perceive the costs from this other form of cutting to be minimal uh, when it comes to health, while the social sanctions from abandoning SUNA would actually be pretty strong. So what these models tend to predict is that it's ultimately about balancing sanction again costs or benefits, and this leads us to think about information campaigns and one of, as one of the possible solutions. So in the remaining three minutes and something, I'm going to try and go through three possible approaches. One is going to work through information, one through coordination, and the other through preferences. So in terms of, in terms of information, we have seen attempts of providing if information about the benefits of working, about gender roles in general. SEMA has done amazing work on this. That's now a policy in India. And also, we've done a project uh, with an information treatment of, on FGC in Sierra Leone. There's very influential work uh, tackling this so-called uh, pluralistic ignorance hypothesis, where the problem lies not so much in my own assessment of the benefits, but in the fact that I think that others are not in support of taking new actions, uh, and Leo Burstein's and Carter's paper on Saudi Arabia is an example of this. And this is actually, one could think, why is it that people have these wrong beliefs? But think about these preferences being transmitted intergenerationally. So it's very clear that I'm going to get the views of my parents who come from a period way back. And also some of these actions that I observe are are taken by earlier cohorts. So it's kind of natural that beliefs might lag behind in some of these settings. And so, again, some of the work we've done with Save the Children in Somalia has been trying to uh, dismantle this potential misalignment of beliefs when it comes to the worst case of uh, uh, circumcision. And I think even though these belief correction interventions are also quite interesting, uh, theoretically, how we can turn them into policy, I think, is still a big challenge. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's also room for the future. Coordination, this is a classic uh, uh, in the study of norms, uh, the idea that maybe the beliefs are all correct, it's just that nobody wants to unilaterally move uh, um, NGOs have understood this, Tostan and others do engage communities in this type of public declarations to get out of bad norms. Um, uh, with the number of co-authors in Somalia, we tried to implement this version of public declaration more uh, at the community setting, in a lab in the field setting, but we didn't find that in and of itself it's enough. If people still hold pessimistic beliefs, nobody's going to take the courage and uh, join this coordination effort. So. I think some of the ongoing work that's very interesting here is the extent to which this coordination should occur in a public or in an anonymous setting. And if you think of escrow mechanisms, for example, the anonymity is actually quite clear in uh, engaging people. And finally, the last bit is about uh, changing preferences through role modeling and aspirations. Here, exposure to in-person role models has been shown to be very effective. Uh, Laurie, Esther's, and co-authors work in India. And I didn't touch on institutions, affirmative action quotas. That's a huge other uh, part of policies that we could work with. But uh, um, some of the work I've done with media, uh, both in Brazil, with Abhijit, uh, in Nigeria, and other people's work, suggests that even vicarious role models can help help shape some of these preferences. But to conclude, there's a view in which all of these concerns I've been voicing about how we change norms are not so important because uh, the process of development and the economic incentives and opportunities that it generates will lead to change in these norms in the spirit of Esther Bothrop's original contribution. 
My personal view is that we should intervene actively with policy for a number of reasons. First, even if the transition occurs, it may be slow, and there are heavy costs for who, all the women who uh, are subject to this inequality in the transition. Second, that the longer people are exposed to these inequalities, the more stereotypes get crystallized. And finally, because those who have decision-making power may not, even if there are these efficiency gains from greater female involvement, they may not want to go for a bigger pie of which they get a smaller uh, a slice. And so uh, that's my call for more work in economics that bridges with other social sciences to incorporate norms. And I think this is already ongoing, but uh, in the area of gender, it's particularly important. Thank you. So thank you very much, Eliana, for that and for keeping to time. Much appreciated. Um, I definitely agree on the focus of, you know, trying to put more attention on the role of cultural norms and then, you know, these norms, uh, different uh, cultural factors in influencing these social and economic outcomes that we see throughout the life of children, particularly on the African continent. Um, so at this point, I'd like to invite our first respondent in the person of Nava Ashraf. She is from the London School of Economics and Political Science. And Nava, you will have 15 minutes for your presentation. You. Let's welcome her with a round of applause. Thank you, and thank you, Eliana, for such a vivid and comprehensive picture of the constraints and challenges that women face from birth onwards. I think as you can see from Eliana's fantastic presentation, it's impossible to study gender in isolation. It's ultimately, both men and women, we are embedded in social structures and in families. And these structures and family decision-making create constraints, create norms that can keep women from achieving their potential. Um, and obviously, overcoming these constraints has implications for both equity, because that's half of the world's population, and efficiency. So in this short discussion that I have, I'm going to focus more on the efficiency side, in particular how Improving gender equity facilitates market efficiency and how it has implications for household efficiency, which is not always positive. So let's take one example. In the past 20 years, we've learned a lot about uh, the potential channels through which improving gender equity would lead to greater economic efficiency in the marketplace. Let's take one example that uh, Eliana also brought up in her presentation on greater female labor force participation. So there's a great overview by Rachel Heath and authors that show that increasing um, female labor force participation impacts human capital of children. That helps to overcome this you know, well-known suboptimal investment in education intergenerationally that occurs. There's um, growing literature on the effects of things like gender equity as well as race equity on the allocation of talent and economic growth. So uh, Oriana, who you heard from this morning, and I have a paper with Virginia and Victor um, using structural estimation and bringing together 100,000 um, employees in personal record, records um, in a, more than 100 countries to estimate the effects of overcoming gender norms on productivity. And what we um, measure is a 32% increase, on average, of increases in productivity. Those efficiency gains are much, much larger. The lower is your starting female labor force participation. So these are very large gains, and that seems really great. Except, as we've also heard, the decision to go and work outside the home, to provide these gains to the market, is made inside the home. And who decides who works? So, you know, true to our atomistic roots as economists, when we first started studying the household in the 1950s, we studied it as a unitary model, um, either as a benevolent dictator or as common preferences, as Samuelson and, and Becker started us on that path. And then we learned that actually differences in preferences are extremely well documented. So here, we're going to take the difference in preference 
that she wants to work, but he doesn't want her to. Now, what's going to happen inside the household? I'm, I'm not going to assume anything else. I'm just going to assume that in marriage, there is repeated interaction and there is commitment. And so under those assumptions, what we traditionally think of is that there should be efficiency, right? So essentially, the efficient thing for the household to do is to maximize joint utility, a sum, a weighted sum of individual utilities. The weights come from your bargaining power, which most of the time we talk about as outside option. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well, subject to a budget constraint. The fact that there are differences in preferences should not impede household efficiency. We should maximize the productivity. And um, I can't tell you how widespread this is. Now, I'm going to show you evidence against it. But this is the, you know, just when you don't talk about unitary models, this is the way that people think. And it is important to work through the logic of it. So what would happen in this case? Um, but both cooperative models um, predict it. Collective models don't even put any kind of structure on the bargaining process. They just assume that we will get to efficiency. Importantly, what is efficient for the household could be very different from policymakers' preferences. The household may decide that it's actually efficient for the woman not to work, um, and, uh, and they say nothing about equity. So now, let's imagine we're, we're very inspired by the presentation, and we're going to enter, and we're going to try to empower women. Okay, not in the maybe gradual way that Eliana talked about, but in the ways, the, the course instruments that we often have. And um, what's going to happen inside the household? So again, in an efficient bargaining model, the bargaining weight of women goes up. What that means is the household should still make efficient choices, should still maximize productivity, but with a different distribution. So now women are better off. Maybe men might be as well off or a little bit worse off, could use transfers to improve their well-being, et cetera. All good for now. The problem is that we have so much evidence increasing on how inefficient households are. And it's particularly problematic when we see the directions of inefficiency. So take Chris's seminal paper in 1996, which I think all of us have been deeply influenced by, where you see that farm efficiency is far suboptimal due to a misallocation of labor inputs between men's and women's farms. And this morning, you heard about uh, ongoing work that he's doing, new work, on the under, understanding the underlying drivers of that inefficiency. So I actually caught him over the, the break, the coffee break, because I didn't know about this recent work. And I said, you know, Chris, um, a very superficial reading of your paper, and papers now in terms of increasing, you know, having not enough political power and not secure land rights, would be just to increase women's bargaining power and give them secure land rights. But my intuition is that that could lead to greater inefficiencies. Is that correct? And he said, if you'd asked me 20 years ago, I would have said increase women's bargaining power. But I no longer think that. And I think the, the, what I'm going to try to put forward to you is that there are some trade-offs that we may face when we think about increasing women's bargaining power that actually could have unintended consequences in the household. Okay. And one of the ways in which we have seen some of the possible mechanisms of these unintended consequences is by using lab in the field experiments to get inside the household. And a lot of these papers, this is just a, a small inkling of the number of papers that have grown in really trying to get inside the household to think about inefficiencies. Because in the lab, if you can design it right so that the household can't undo what they've done in the lab outside and that you can correlate it with outside things that's really you know, capturing something real, the amazing thing about the lab is that you can actually measure the efficient frontier. right? So you can measure exactly what it takes if you want to you know, donate to a, a common pool and double or triple that amount versus you know, hide it for yourself, for example. So you can kind of quantify the gains left on the table that come from the desire for control and the need for hiding and, and uh, strategic options. And, and I'll just highlight one. Um, so many of these are so great, and they, they, they are, are, are correlated with you know, ineffe inefficient productivity in the farm, in, in, um, in the business. But Anandi Mani's uh, paper shows that, <clears throat> actually on, on norms, um, when so she has a few different treatments, but when men make more women money exogenously than their wives do, which is a, a norm that is it's counter-normative, um, 
or sorry, when, when men make less money counter-normatively than their wives do, there's actually what she calls spite, which means they destroy the pie. And, and so that's not even just hiding some of the income, it's actually destroying some of the pie that's out there. And, um, and again, this isn't everyone, but the fact that this is possible makes us just pause. And we have some evidence that cash transfers, like from Progressive, for example, can lead to um, violence within the household as a way of taking back some of the power. And Sarah Lowe's great work that combines public coordination games with matrilocal traditions shows that empowering women actually can lead to less coordination um, and, and worse household outcomes in the game. So is this just societal efficiency at the cost of household efficiency and potentially well-being? Are these trade-offs that we have to kind of swallow? Or is there a way around them? And here, I would like to share two examples um, from my work in Zambia. I've been really privileged to um, spend the last 16 years working in Zambia on gender and household, um, a place where the norms are very, very different than the ones we may have grown up with or used to. And that has pushed me in certain directions that I don't think I would have been pushed before, so I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, so the first is a, is a paper with Erica Field and, and Jean Lee, where we provided, this is a, a, you know, even though it's a middle-income country, very high fertility rate, so almost five or six in peri-urban areas. Um, so this provided access to longer-term contraceptives, to partners together, or women alone. The women alone treatment was meant to mimic actually the majority of family planning programs that are uh, targeting women, in particular because their preferences are closest to the policymakers. They want fewer children, they want to invest in those children. And, um, and it turns out that, in fact, the individual treatment does lead to a 20% uh, greater likelihood to visit the family planning nurse, 40% likelihood of taking up the contraceptive, and two years later, a 27% reduction in births. And actually, when I presented this originally to a stakeholder meeting, there were a lot of Western NGOs, uh, Planned Parenthood, Marie Stopes, et cetera, who said, okay, this is fantastic news. This is exactly what we've thought. What we need to do is push out these technologies to women alone, and we can get the reduction in fertility that we've needed. The problem is we, we did ask about subjective well-being in the study. And it turns out that there's women in the couples group report significantly less subjective well-being than the women in the individuals group. Now, the women in the individuals group are not less uh, happy than the ones in the control group. So contraceptive access is great, <laughs> but they're certainly less happy than in the couples group. And this was a profound puzzle for us because they could just hand over the voucher to their husbands and replicate the couples treatment. Why didn't they do that if they knew it was going to cause them this kind of unhappiness and lower subjective well-being? So we interviewed the women. And what they told us is, like we heard this morning, you know, this is uh, I mean, one in 57 women die in childbirth over their lifetime in Zambia. This is a setting of great risk. And so they are willing to take the contraception and reduce their children, but they're not super happy about it. And so they said, couldn't you talk to our husbands? And that's what the Zambian government said to us, too. This is great. We do want to reduce fertility, but this is not enough for us. We care about family unity. We want you to put that at the heart. We see that these results are driven by men who want more kids than their wives do. Can't you figure out a way to align preferences? I mean, unlike Eliana's great work, that's a pretty, I was like overwhelmed by how do we change preferences. <laughs> Um, it turns out there was something that was a little bit easier, which was that the demand for children wasn't just driven by preferences, it was also driven by a misalignment in an understanding of maternal risk. So even though the maternal risk is so high, it is the most gendered sphere of information there is, is because men are not in the labor ward with the women. And so they don't know these risks in the same way, and they don't feel them in the same way. So what we did is that we created a pro, uh, um, an intervention that shared with men and, and in one side and others with their wives, salient, uh, precise information on maternal risk. Whether we treat men or women with this information, they both will see a reduction in pregnancy of the same order of magnitude that we saw in the earlier study, but through different mechanisms. And in particular, it's only when we treat the men that their beliefs update, the information spreads to their wives, they report greater communication, and importantly, both report greater marital satisfaction. So 
this is something that now the Zambian government is, is wanting to scale up because it's, it's something that they consider Zambia-centric family planning policy in the sense that it puts family unity at its heart. So one last example, um, which is actually of a different life stage for girls. This is grade eight girls who would drop out at three times the rate that boys would in Zambia. Um, and we wanted to figure out something that would help and we wanted to build and adapt a negotiation curriculum, which is often taught in many life skills curriculum. The problem was that the Zambian IRB, who I love, and we go through, like it's often like a two-year process with the Zambian IRB, they said, you are gonna create a cadre of unruly girls. We have very different norms here of how girls should behave. Um, that's not gonna work. <laughs> so we worked with um, a lot of teachers and a lot of young women who come from the same compounds as these girls do. And we adapted the curriculum over a two-year process to include not only the scenarios that, that girls face, but also a way of having these interpersonal negotiation skills that build joint gains for the other side as well. And actually, where they used the most was with their parents in helping them stay in school. And a lot of the reason they were so effective was because they were able to understand their parents' interests and needs and stand up for their own interests and needs. Um, and that turned into significant gains in human capital investment and transition to secondary school. And now we're following these women, young women who are now entering the labor force and uh, going into the marriage market. Um, crucially, we, we compared it to a kind of what we call an individual empowerment condition, which is a safe space, a, a kind of standard tradition, uh, intervention that's used. And uh, there, we don't find the same gains, and in particular, we find a little bit of a backlash effect from parents. So in the relational empowerment, what we call the relational empowerment intervention, parents actually report that the girls are more respectful, they actually do more chores, they've just intertemporally shifted when they do the chores, for example. And then we use a lab in the field game with that same frontier, an investment game, to see how these girls are actually doing this. Are they able to make these joint gains? And so this is, we bring the girls and their guardians into a lab that we make at the schools, and we do the trust game, which is just, you know, you have some endowment as a girl, as a girl, sorry, as the guardian, the guardian can hand over to the girl, it triples, and the girl can send back. And we randomize whether you get a negotiation, a communication treatment or not. When you get a communication treatment, negotiation girls, as you can see from this graph, are able to get much closer to the frontier. So they both guardians and girls are better off, but they're also able to ask for more than what they want. So I think this shows us just that relationships, especially in the family, can create all the constraints that we just saw and all the kind of strategic challenges <laughs> that we saw, but they can also create great surplus. And I think particularly when we think about dealing with places of much different cultural norms than ours, valuing the surplus value, value of marriage and family unity while also seeking these socially desirable outcomes is a way of actually reaching the preferences of both men and women um, underlying. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neva. So now we invite our second respondent in the person of Dori Purcell. She's from the University of Witwatersrand. You have 15 minutes. Let's welcome her with a round of applause. So good afternoon, everyone. What a privilege it is to be here. I don't have slides, but I do have notes. So um, forgive me, pretend it's a history lecture. Um, <laughs> so we've heard a lot about the household in the session, and that's because it's a primary institution in society, and it's a basic analytical category for much of the work that we do on the microeconomics of development and on gender in particular. So as my colleagues on the panel ha and others at the symposium have so masterfully demonstrated, there has been considerable progress in theoretical and empirical scholarship on the household. Um, the household is no longer the black box of textbook neoclassical economics as it was. When I was a student, it's recognized as a place where not only consumption decisions are made, but also decisions about the allocation of labor to paid and unpaid work, uh, decisions about the timing and the number of children, and a range of investment and savings decisions, including the investment in children. 
In my 15 minutes, I'm going to remind us of three developments that have in many ways laid the foundations for the kind of work that Ileana, Nava, and others have undertaken. And then I'm going to highlight three areas where I think more research can be done in the future. So firstly, a key development in our work on gender over the last two decades has been the measurement of work that happens in the household. Time use surveys record allocations of labor in the household across different activities, and they thereby expose the, ex the extent of care work and its persistently unequal distribution by gender. Using these data, we can compare not only mean time allocations to activities, but we can also compare real-time trajectories. So when we look at real-time trajectories in South Africa, for example, and I'm sure it would be the case elsewhere in the world, we find that women typically start the day far earlier than do men, spending time on social reproduction or care work, and they end the day by spending far less time on leisure. Measuring care work makes this work visible. It shifts uh, perceptions that it's simply a labor of love and a labor of women's love in particular, and it makes it possible to assess how time allocations change and how gender differences in these allocations change as the socioeconomic and policy environments change. Think about what happened during COVID when schools were closed and all, work was all care work was taken into the household. Who bore the brunt of that care work? Well, we know that it was women because we were measured time allocations in the household. Second, as the household has come to be interrogated, so models of the inner workings of the household have become more nuanced and empirically anchored. As we've seen today in the session, the, unitary, uh, the initial unitary cooperative household model has been replaced by models that recognize both cooperation and conflict in a household where preferences may diverge and where information is not symmetrical. Theoretical and empirical scholarship has therefore engaged more with the exercise of power and increasingly with how social context, including norms, culture, and tradition, mediate decision-making and resource allocation in households, and hopefully future work on households and on gender will continue to engage with the complexities of power and social context. Third, taking an analytical lens to the household has not only involved getting inside households once they are formed, but it has also uh, entailed investigating why households are formed in the first place. And this has led to more recognition of living arrangements as an important livelihood strategy, meaning that households are not exogenous to development outcomes, they may very well be endogenous. So a very Common finding in the development literature is that larger households are poorer households, but the causality may run from poverty to bigger households. Because people are poor, they have to live in bigger households. In a country like South Africa, for example, with persistently high rates of unemployment, jobless, joblessness rates amongst young adults exceeding 70%, who you live with is sometimes your only livelihood strategy. It's the buffer between having no resources and living on the street. Household living arrangements are also an important livelihood strategy because the costs of living together do not increase linearly as household size increases. Living together offers significant economies of scale when people share fixed costs, such as the costs of rent and services, in the case of collective consumption goods, and when combining resources enables people to make bulk purchases, which are typically cheaper per unit. When you have very little, these kinds of savings may comprise really important ways of making your income stretch further. The importance of living arrangements as a livelihood strategy was clearly illustrated during COVID. Uh, in South Africa, for example, during the first two months of the lockdown, I estimated that between five and six million adults in two months changed their living arrangements, moving from one household to another in response to substantial job loss. So briefly, in summary, the three developments that I've highlighted is that reproductive labor is now measured and visible, typically work undertaken by women, more recognition of conflict and social context, and more attention paid to household formation and the possibility that living arrangements may be non-exogenous to economic status. But of course, there's more to be done, and I'm going to point to three areas in the remainder of my discussion. 
The first is that households formed around residential conjugal units remain the default in analytical work. And this was an obvious place to start, but we need to think more about modeling and interrogating behavior and resource allocations in households that do not conform to this household type, where households are not formed around a couple. In fact, they might not include both men and women, but they are more complex they are, might be extended, and they might also be what we call stretched over space. In other words, households may include, as household members, people who are not resident in the household for much of the year, but they are still considered to be household members. The classic labor migrant being a really good example. These are more often the household types of developing countries. So by some estimates, about 40% of the world's population live in households that include relatives other than children and parents. In South Africa, about a third of all older adults, adults aged 60 or older, black African older adults, live in households where at least one person is considered to be a member of the household, but they are not resident in that household for much of the year. Second, I would argue that work interrogating the household has not fed adequately into all areas of development economics. For example, how living arrangements change in response to changes in socioeconomic circumstances could be given more attention in studies of behavioral responses to policy interventions. I want to discuss a really, really simple 101 example to illustrate my point, and that is the very widely cited metrics of development that we use all the time, rates of poverty or rates of inequality, and I'm going to focus on rates of poverty, and for simplicity, I'm going to talk about income poverty. So as you all know, to generate rates of poverty using microdata, you add up all sources of income in the household, and you typically divide by household size, and then you compare per capita household income to the poverty line. We do this because there are people in the household who don't directly earn or receive an income. Children, full-time homemakers being obvious examples, but also the unemployed or people who are inactive. And we can't assume that because they don't receive any income directly, that therefore they have no income. We have to assume that they're sharing out of resources. The common concern with per capita household income measures is that they ignore within household inequality. So it's not just that resources are shared, but the assumption is that all resources are shared equally. And I'm going to pick up on this shortly, but I'd like to start with another concern, which I'm sure you can all um, in, uh, guess what it is, word funding problem, sorry, which is that per capita measures are completely insensitive to economies of scale. In fact, they assume that there are no economies of scale in the household at all. And given what we know about living arrangements as a livelihood strategy, this means that per capita measures likely underestimate the reach of economic resources. And if we think that economies of scale are likely to be bigger in larger households, then they will underestimate resources, particularly in larger households, which are also more likely to be poor households. So exactly the kinds of households that we care about when we do a poverty analysis. This limitation of per capita measures probably helps to explain why I have found in South Africa that people living in larger households are far more likely to be measured as poor using an income or expenditure measure of poverty than they are to self-assess their economic status as poor. But the reverse is true for people living alone or with one other person who are much more likely to self-assess their economic status as poor than they are to be measured as poor. It's not that there's been no response to per capita measures. We all know that there is a very large literature by now estimating equivalent scales so we can compare households of different sizes and different composition. But the scales are difficult to estimate. They're often specific for a country or a set of countries or even for a particular data set which makes comparability very difficult, which is why per capita measures remain the default in our presentation of poverty and inequality rates. So the challenge of this really, really simple exercise is how to create a standardized and globally adopted measure of shared income that replaces the per capita uh, adjustment. Another set of problems with equivalent scales and picking up on the problem I flagged earlier is, like, is that like per capita measures, they do not recognize the possibility of within household inequality. And this is a problem because there's by now substantial evidence that tells us that who earns the income matters for how that income is spent. 
Because everyone in the household is given the same poverty status, we can only identify gender differences in income to the extent that men and women live in different households. If they live in the same household, they have the same poverty status. And this helps to explain the emphasis in the gender and development literature on distinguishing between female and male-headed households to identify gender disadvantage. For example, when we think about the feminization of poverty thesis, it's usually presented as female-headed households are more vulnerable to poverty than male-headed households, and a growing share of households is female-headed. Headship data are regularly collected in household surveys, and it's almost routine that when people do gender, they distinguish between female and male-headed households. But the categorization has been long and widely criticized, not only in academic, but also in policy circles, partly because headship can mean very different things in different cultures and different contexts. So in South Africa, for example, more than 40% of female-headed households include men, about a third of whom are engaged in employment and are generating an income. So my third point then on what needs to be done is we need to think more about how to investigate gender inequality in the context of the household where some sharing of resources occurs. We can invoke a set of sharing rules, for example, and provide po possible ranges for poverty rates. But the more interesting questions are what establishes the extent of sharing in households, among whom are resources shared, how does this differ by gender, and how does it differ across different household types? For a simple tweak, we can, re we can refine the concept of female-headed households to ensure that these households exclude resident men and can be identified independently of headship. So I've termed these households female-dominated households, households where all the adults in the household are women. In South Africa, over 20% of households are female-dominated in that the, the adults in the household are all women. Slightly less than 20% of households are male-dominated. All the adults in the household are men. So over 40% of households in South Africa do not include both men and women in the same household. What's interesting is that when women live without men, they mostly live with children. When men live without women, they mostly live alone. What's important is that when you compare female-dominated households with all other households, you can identify a much larger gap in the economic status of households than when you compare female and male-dominated households, which suggests that the concept of female-dominated households is doing a much better job at identifying the disadvantage that arises for women and children when they have to rely on the income earned or generated by women alone. So I'd like to conclude in my last minute with two points about investigating gender inequality. The first is that the difficulties of assigning income or expenditure to everyone in the house household highlights an important advantage of non-money metric measures of well-being, which have become uh, increasingly recognized as important development outcomes, such as happiness, life satisfaction, depression, or loneliness. Because in contrast to money metric measures, which must be allocated across both earners and dependents, non-money metric measures are individually assigned. It's my level of happiness. It's got nothing to do with your level of happiness. And an added advantage is that people may be more willing to disclose how happy they are with life or how satisfied they are than to disclose how much income they earn or receive, information about which people are notoriously reluctant to disclose, even to others in the same household. And second, we need to spend more time looking at the tails of the distribution and not only at average differences or average partial effects. From a policy perspective, it's surely useful to interrogate characteristics associated with gender gaps that are, that are larger or smaller or even reversed. As feminist economists have been telling us for a long time, we need to recognize difference among women. We need to recognize that gender intersects with a whole range of other social identifiers. Thank you. Well done, thank you. Oh. Okay. So thank you very much to our three speakers um, for their presentation. So at this point, I'd like to open up for Q&A. Questions you have, comments, contributions. I'm happy to take them at this time.
Don't tell me my speakers kept to time and then they are not I could have spoken so. at half the speed. <laughs> so do we have any? Okay, I see a hand up by Ariana, and then I'll take you, and then you third. So we'll take the first round, and then Seema, and then if there's time, we'll take a second round. So starting with you. So thank you, all of you. This is wonderful presentations. I have a question about measuring women's work and valuing women's work. Uh, we can measure what they do, but how do we put a value? I've always banged my head on the wall when it comes to that one. But it seems to be absolutely essential. Even the fact that we call them not at work. Yes. It should be called work inside the house mm -hmm. and work outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So let's take a round and then we'll, if you want to in, uh, direct your question to someone in particular, you may do so otherwise. The lady in the purple shirt. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. That was brilliant. Sorry to interrupt. Please remember to introduce yourself. Yes. yes. My name is Catherine Neal. I'm from the School of Economics at UCT. Um, that was brilliant. It's so tricky uh, coming, and I know, Dory, a long time ago, we were, at, um, we were at an event where the gendered, the binary nature of analysis was sort of raised. And we know that it's tricky with household surveys, but just in general, it's so hard trying to incorporate that aspect. That's just one thing which I wonder if there's anything, you know, if anybody has come up with anything there. Um, more specifically, we talk about gender, but so often we're focusing on women, which makes sense. But there are very many men's issues which don't get, uh, don't get impacted, uh, don't get investigated, which impact on women. And one specific one is men's access to healthcare. Because if men were healthier, women would be healthier, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of HIV, TB, et cetera. And that's, you know, I know not too much. I'm interested to know if there's, there's more that's known on that. Okay, so yeah. you can note the questions. And then we have the lady at the back. Don't forget to introduce yourself. Thank you very much. I am um, Oluwa Bumi Adejumo from the Obafemi Olo University in Nigeria. Yeah, I wanted to... I don't know why I'm so particular. I don't know if it happened. But um, I think I'm coming from the angle of if, you, if a woman is more empowered or better empowered, then our productivity is likely to increase. And then now we're coming up with a narrative that she could even be less productive or less efficient or inefficient because of some family conditions and all that. I don't know if I got it right, but I think that's what, uh -huh. so I, I, I'm still, and I think that still boils down to, I don't know to, to the extent you took that into consideration, to the um, issues of um, family conditions, initial family conditions before the intervention. I, I want to have the assume you did, you did that or something, but for me, I think, that's the first step to go, or the first way to go. Because someone who believes in gender subordination or subjugation and has a strong antecedent for that, who believes that, I have several examples around and um, personally, who believes that an empowered woman will become proud or we become um, less submissive. Mm -hmm. well, no matter the intervention you give that person, you will kill that in intervention. And I think that's why the Zambian women were saying, talk to our spouses. And then I think that's one major, you have to break that jinx and break it hard for any intervention to sail through. So once that initial condition is there, I wonder to what extent these interventions will work. Then another question I want to ask is on paid labor for gender or for women, as it were. Um, to what extent is a woman productive or unproductive when she has to do um, household chores and um, take care of the children? Um, they, are, they have been classified as unpaid labor. That is, she's laboring, she's, in the la she's working, but not necessarily earning an income. And that also applies to the issue of measuring um, the, 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 the woman, the, the, uh, our productivity or unproductivity. I don't know how to put that, but I'm just thinking aloud. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Let's take a last question from Seema, and then I'll give you the chance to answer. 
<laughs> you like, okay, then maybe we'll take it to the next round. All right, so then you had the questions. You can take it mm -hmm. in any order. Do we start with you, Eliana? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, maybe I'll just take a subset uh, of those. <laughs> <That's fine>. uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, one is, uh, uh, I think you uh, rightly pointed out to the fact that we've been discussing all of these in terms of binary uh, gender identity. Um, it's clear that uh, uh, society is evolving and even our understanding and modeling of gender need to catch up. I am not aware of efforts being done in that direction. The only thing that comes to mind is within political economy, there is a literature on identity that's understood to be endogenous, and some of the modeling there uses continuous uh, uh, variables for that. So I don't know if in the future we are going to see um, our own modeling evolving in that direction. Uh, in terms of empirical research, I do think there are very interesting uh, efforts, uh, uh, at least uh, the subfield that looks at uh, gender and stereotypes uh, to look at the counter stereotypical choices on both sides. Uh, and uh, uh, a former student of Oriana and Nava, who is now in Milan, Alexia Delfino, is doing very interesting work on men not taking up uh, what are perceived as being female jobs. And so we normally look the other way around. So I think there are many areas, uh, you mentioned the health uh, side, but there are many of these choices where um, gender doesn't necessarily mean looking at women. Um, uh, I think the choice of this panel probably thinking about uh, uh, low-income countries and relatively traditional societies, it seems that uh, the bulk of the inequality and the uh, concerns that we have when it comes to gender have to do with women. But, you know, it's a, it's a broader uh, question. And then uh, uh, just... Uh, about your, um, I think you rightly put this emphasis on um, what you call initial conditions and the, the role that these uh, pre-existing uh, beliefs or constraints uh, play. Um, the most successful policies here, Nava has given some examples about how she went about it, I think incorporate those uh, elements of culture into the design of whatever program we're discussing. And uh, uh, we have ongoing work with, with a number of co-authors in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, where the government has been titling uh, um, and also is interested in uh, uh, certification uh, of marriages. Uh, and the narrative about those uh, um, both land uh, uh, asset transfers and uh, the benefits from certification uh, as opposed to customary marriages, the way we uh, set it up in uh, understanding with our local counterparts is really to highlight the win-win. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> nature of this, uh, meaning uh, women might have more incentives to work on the land if they are part of it, uh, and the, the safety that these uh, uh, marriages provide, even though eventually the woman will be entitled to half of the land, uh, but this safety is going to change uh, the happiness within the house. So, so very much the narrative about this uh, uh, you know, uh, intervention has been to try and realize this uh, um, notion of well-being within the household, which kind of goes towards what both Dori and Nava has been saying about uh, how we understand choices. Thank and then on the measurement and everything else, <laughs> <laughs> we'll defer. Right. Okay. Um, so on the binary nature, and the non, I, that is something I, I actually wanted, I almost was going to bring it up in, 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 my, in my discussion. Um, I think it's really important because actually, so in my, in my job market paper on spousal control, the, the point I was trying to make is that it's not about gender, it's about roles in the household. And so if we actually look at roles in the household, they are what are creating the strategic incentives for control and hiding and all of these things. And those are different across different cultures. So I, one of the conversations that I think thinking outside of a binary uh, category allows us to have is just what are the dimensions through which gender manifests in a household? It's, it's often in terms of these roles and norms that can manifest regardless of what you are biologically, right? And so I think, I think that's, that's really crucial, and it goes to these initial conditions. And 
I think if we don't understand, for example, the initial conditions of the roles that people play in their household and the ways that may um, create incentives for hiding or control, then we introduce an intervention that's going to have you know, unintended consequences in the household, we won't, we won't, uh, we'll, we'll get it wrong in terms of its implications. And so I, I think I want to go to, to this point that um, I certainly was not trying to say that an empowered woman is not a productive woman. She's very, I mean, yes, <laughs> certainly you get more productive as, as you become more empowered. The only point is that we do this then jointly in a household in which the, the other person can respond to what's happening. And so it's more about, you know, the, and this is a very specific definition of efficiency that we have in, in the, the economics literature, in which those kinds of inefficiencies can arise. But they're sort of tragic, you know, so you're exactly right that you want to actually intervene in a way that goes to the very roots of that so that those inefficiencies don't arise. I just think that a lot of times, you know, in the past 20 years when we've thought about empowering women, we have a very, we can either have a superficial or relatively, I don't know how I want to say individualistic or Western notion of that, which doesn't take into account these other cultural aspects. It's a great point. Um, yes? Okay. So about the non-binary, I mean, my first place to start would be let's measure it, right? And all it takes, and I try to get this introduced into the NIDS cram, which is a, a survey we conducted during COVID, was can we please have a third response option? Male, female, other, but that was, yeah, uh, responses are expensive, so it was decided not to include it. But it, I think a good place to start would be to identify how many people identify as other, just so that we have a sense of, you know, who, who is non-binary and what are the characteristics and yeah, what's the distribution, etc. cetera. Um, about um, men's health, absolutely. And mm. in, in South African yeah. context, we know the implications of men being HIV positive and how they thought they could could cure themselves of being HIV positive, which was to have sex with a with a, a, a virgin, young a young woman, and that would solve the problems of uh, of um, HIV. And I think in general, um, if we want to improve the position of women, we have to educate men, as um, yeah. the presenters on this panel have so clearly um, illustrated. About initial conditions, I think that for me, the, the, we need to talk to sociologists and anthropologists and and historians to understand what where these initial conditions come from. You know, they're not exogenous. We don't want to resort to gender essentialism to be able to explain the initial conditions. We want to understand how they evolve and what influences them and what perpetuates them. About measuring unpaid work, mm. so there's a big project called the Accounting Project, which has tried to measure work. The standard way is to either look at the opportunity costs, so what women could have earned in the labor market, or to use um, median or mean earnings for women in the labor market, yeah, but, but the, um, the problem is that both these methods import a gender bias from the labor market into the household, there, thereby um, uh, reducing the value of work. But there are a number of countries which have satellite accounts, which show, despite these limitations, which show the value of unpaid work in the household and what it, how big it is relative to GDP and how the, the value of this work changes, for example, with austerity measures, which increase unpaid work in the household. So it's not perfect, but it gives us some kind of roadmap or some, yeah. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for your responses. As you can tell, we are out of time for this session, but we do have um, a 30 minute. I'm so. Thank you for your observation. <laughs> Um, okay, um, so <coughs> if you have any other questions, we do have a 30-minute um, coffee break after this, um, so please feel free to interact with the speakers. For those of you who had a, a few more follow-up questions. S sorry? The, the timetable is wrong. It's only 15 minutes. So well, it says 15.15 15 to 15.45. No, but, it's, but look, look before, you'll see that there's a, a scheduling yes. problem. It's, I did notice that. It said 15.15 15 to 15.30, but there's a lag. Um, I don't know if you notice it. Do you see? So if you look at... So do we have 30 minutes? 15. Only 15. So we 15. come back at 15.30, at 3.30. OK, 
Okay, no problem. So we all come back at 1545. Okay. So before you leave, please let's give a round of applause for our speakers. Yes. So thank you very much. Yes. Okay.